Assalamu alaikum everyone. Welcome to our Global Iftar 2021, which is brought to you by the Ramadan Tent Project. Now, Global Iftar is the world's largest virtual iftar. We're beginning in London and we're going to follow the sun across the globe to the US, Australia, India, Qatar, South Africa, Turkey, and then back to London again. So thank you so, so much for joining us today in London today in the UK. My name is Farah and I will be your host for this evening. We have an absolutely exciting event planned for this evening with Zara Mohammed. Now, Zara is the Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain. And um, before we get started, I would first like to thank our media partner for this year, Islam Channel, and give a special welcome to um, those joining us from Islam Channel's Facebook and YouTube. It's a pleasure to have you join us today. I'd also like to thank the Arts Council UK, and their help has allowed us to continue our work this Ramadan, all of which is available on our website. And our work this Ramadan is also supported by Islamic Relief, who is our charity partner. And you can check out the incredible work that Islamic Relief does at iruk.co forward slash RTP. Our events are interactive. Um, so for those who don't know, we would love everyone just to jump onto Zoom, whether you're watching us on Facebook or YouTube. If you can, drop on, drop, jump onto the Zoom. And for those who are comfortable, turn your cameras on so we can see you. Um, run through the tech at the bottom of your screens or in the more section of your mobile you're going to see a reactions option so you can show us how you're feeling in real time now there's also a raise hand option as well if you want to ask our speaker a question or add to the discussion and somebody will uh, mute you so without further ado let's crack on uh, i'm just gonna say islam to iman today so iman it's lovely to have you join us today Assalamualaikum. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. I'm really excited for the uh, Global Iftar event that we're going to be running for the next couple of hours. Not couple, 24. But yeah, I'm excited. How are you doing? I'm good, alhamdulillah. It's been, um, my fast has actually gone by super fast today. So uh, that, that's a good thing. Um, what are you having for Iftar today, um, Iman? Ooh. So I don't think about food so far, but what about you? Uh, we're actually going to attempt to make chana chaat. Oh, my favorite. Yeah, I, I like to have it without the Bombay mix and the poppet, but my sister want, prefers it with that. So we're going to make two separate ones. <laughs> my father, do you mean the crispy bits? Yeah, yeah. I like it with yogurt and she's like, yeah, yogurt's fine, but like the best part is the Bombay mix and the poppity on it. So I'm like, yeah, no. You know what? I agree. I think the crispy bits are the best bits and especially if you put peanuts on. And I'd be actually intrigued to know who doesn't like crispy bits on their poppery, on their chana chart. Cause... Only because they get soggy. That's the thing. Like, I, I just can't deal with it. So minute, it either yeah. should be crispy all throughout, or it should just be like a dahi based something. I can't deal with. Yeah. Do you put like a, a tamarind chutney on yours? Yeah, yeah, for sure. That and a chaat masala. Yeah. Oh wow, Iman, I'm actually feeling hungry. I've been doing some. Um, I've been I've had such a busy um, few weeks with work, and I thought today I'm just going to step up a little bit. So I've been doing some baking um, afternoon. Yeah. So my family yeah, treat yourself. Yeah. Well, it's my the family are definitely getting cupcakes today. So after I finish, I'm going to quickly. Oh, there. <laughs> We're having pistachio yeah. and rose water good. cupcakes today. So, nice. inshallah. Yeah. Inshallah. inshallah. Hopefully, it'll go well. So, you know, I've got Rehan's. Yeah, not long to go. <laughs> I'm wondering what Rehan's options are, actually, um, what opinions are even. Rehan, what are your opinions on Janajan? Um. I don't Which know. Without crispy bits. I don't mind either way, to be honest. Really? I'm not really that fast, yeah. Jart is not really my, I mean, Jart's good, but it's not really my, it's not really what I think about when it comes to, I mean, my mum makes it, but I don't know. It's just, I'm neutral on it, unfortunately. No, you're disqualified. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, Rob. We're not having you again. <laughs> what are you having? But he does like fried samosas, he wants. So, you know. Okay, got... then, then, yeah, we'll, we'll, give you some leeway there yeah, no no baked samosas um <laughs> <No>. <laughs> also i intrigued also in the chat I, i'd love to know what everyone's having in, the, in for their iftar today and um rehan what are you having for iftar today uh well actually my aunt called me like right before i logged on i think my mom's going to pick something up so i guess i'll find out <laughs> i'll find out when i go downstairs 
of Star Roulette. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Well, same. I, I'm still debating. I've just seen somebody here calling from Uzbekistan. Nafisa, are we are, you, are we good to unmute Nafisa here? It's like in Uzbekistan. Ah, oh, Salam alaikum, Nafisa. Yes, yes, yes. Salam alaikum. Good evening. How are you? I am well, very well. Thank you. It, it's Thank fantastic to have you on. Could you be a little bit louder? Is that okay? Yes. yes. Oh, lovely. So, how how is it in Uzbekistan? How are you? How's your Ramadan? Alhamdulillah, it's a really beautiful Ramadan is going on in here. Alhamdulillah, weather is perfect. Like everything is perfect. Alhamdulillah, and I'm so glad to join this co this community again. It was last time that I had joined this open star for the first time, and this year it is the first time I have been ever attending it. And I'm getting so emotional, like remembering last year's memories, and I'm glad to see people here that I used to meet last year. Oh my God, it's amazing, mashallah. Oh, Nafisa, it's so happy to have you and so glad to have your enthusiasm. It's, it's just been a pleasure. It's so nice to hear like a smiley face as well. And yeah. how, how has your Ramadan been, Nafisa? And also we'd love to hear what you are having for Iftar today. Okay, actually it is uh, 11 and half past p.m. in Uzbekistan. So I already had my Iftar. And actually today I had a iftar by myself. I decided to eat some burgers and Caesar salad <laughs> because I was outside of the house. Uh, however, on the typical day, we have like delicious Uzbek food, actually home cooking food. So far, this is the first time I have ever eaten outside <laughs> from the beginning of the Ramadan. That sounds absolutely delicious though, still. Um, and I'm pleased you actually managed to break your fast on time. And I think Uzbek food is also really interesting. One of my university friends is from um, Uzbekistan. So I learned um, a lot about the country. Um, so it sounds, it's an absolutely amazing country with such beautiful architecture as well. It just, yeah, I would love to visit all of us. We, we now want to, all of us uni friends, we now want to go to Uzbekistan. Inshallah, I would love to, you know, just host you, all of you, one day if you come. In addition, I'm a tourism student and I have a lot of friends who I actually invited from outside of the country, like foreign friends, and I really love to introduce my country as guide for making tours for them. So this is amazing. I would oh, fantastic. Well, if your friend is there, do tell them to message us. We'd love to hear from your friend as well. Ah, uh, sorry? If your friend is about, do tell your friend to message us or jump on. So it would be nice to talk to your friend also. Oh. So we, we look forward to hearing from everyone joining us uh, from all the different parts of the world. We're really excited to, you know, do the lift art this year. And it would be great to get as many people on as possible from all around the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My friend is not here, so today, inshallah, next time. Inshallah, next time. Thank you so much, Nafisa. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Yes, the same here. See you. Asalaamu Alaikum. And um, Zara, I'm just going to move on to our guest, Zara Mohammed. So, Asalaamu Alaikum. How are you and how's your Ramadan been? Alhamdulillah, it's been good. It's been very fast. Um, but, you know, I think with any time that we experience Ramadan, there's always a tranquility, there's always this comfort and this opportunity. So I always think that you kind of, it passes you by, but you're always trying to hold on to it. So you can just grab it a little bit longer. So no much like it's been, it's been very blessed and of, of, of course, a wonderful time to reconnect. I would absolutely agree with you. This year has absolutely, for me, it's, it's flown by. Um, last year was so much more slow paced um, in the lockdown, which was, I guess a blessing of lockdown, um, and this year as we as we head towards um, a degree of normality, I know it mine's um, absolutely flown by. And before we hear from your um, your talk, which you're really excited about today, what are you having for iftar today? So we're going to have some roast chicken um, mm. with you know some potatoes and uh, trying to avoid fried food, but who knows? <laughs> who knows what will happen by that hour of the day? <laughs> So my husband and I have said we're going to do like no fat, uh, no fried food, but well, it's been a difficult journey, arduous. 
That, that is actually really brave. I mean, we we have a lot less than we used to um, when my her family used to join us for iftar, and then obviously we'd have the pakoras and everything. Um, but yeah, this year we've definitely been a lot a lot more healthy. And, um, and for those who don't know, um, as I said before to, to everybody, before Zara is the Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain. Zara Mohammed um, is the first woman to hold that post, and she's going to be speaking to us about um, her role and leadership. And yeah, we're really, really excited to hear from you, Zara. So um, if you're ready, over to you. Well, thank you so much. Well, I'd first like to thank uh, Ramadan Tent Project for this wonderful invitation. It's a project that, I mean, a campaign, a, a community initiative, you know, I think it's something that's really changed a lot of lives and added a lot of impact in that taking the spirit of Ramadan just beyond even the month, because I know you do iftars all throughout the year, but it's that spirit of community that I think, you know, is inspiring for so many. So even when I was in my university days, you know, if you could get, get to one of these RTP iftars in London, you know, outside and, you know, it would be completely a blessing in and of itself. So thank you so much for, for the invitation. And um, I should begin by saying Bismillah Rahman Rahim and Assalamu Alaikum everybody. And I think today I just wanted to reflect on, I guess, some of my lessons in leadership, but also, you know, looking now at the last 10 days of Ramadan, you know, what is it that we have remaining? And what is it that we need to seize and how do we make the best of this time? And, you know, being um, now in my third month of term as a first and any first faces a lot of challenges, there's always a lot of things to reflect on. And I think that's why I've been quite blessed that Ramadan has come when it's come, because it's allowed me to actually think about, you know, my own journey so far and what are the things that I feel I need to work on or develop. And so the first thing I was thinking about is, you know, Ramadan makes us think about sacrifice. We stop eating and you know, hopefully doing other bad things, you know, we're a bit nicer. Um, we're generally trying to be a little bit more polite, you know, restrain, there's a lot of restraint. And I always think that, you know, when you're in a role of leadership, any kind of leadership, any position of influence or responsibility, th there's always that temptation to, to not be so restrained, you know, to say exactly what you think and how you feel and to get worked up. And I think one of the beautiful things about Ramadan is that discipline of the soul, that restraint, and that idea that actually um, a lot of our life we live in haste. So perhaps this is a good time to slow down and to really reflect on what is the impact of our leadership style and approach? What is the difference we're actually making? And in this blessed time where, where we're a little bit more restrained, we're a little bit more cautious, what can we learn to apply in our daily routine? And, you know, it's sometimes, I mean, even in Ramadan, I've been back to back on Zoom meetings. And the great thing about iftar time is everyone has to stop and everyone has to give you some space and everybody has to, you know, just actually, this is my time between me and Allah. So I'm just going to take that time and to, of course, open my fast. And so I think there's the idea that in your day, there has to be some balance in your life. There has to be some harmony and there has to be some discipline. And that kind of takes me to my next lesson, which is the opportunity for goodness. I think in, you know, being the Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain, and for maybe those of you who aren't aware, we're the largest and most uh, broad and diverse umbrella body in the, the UK. So we represent Muslim organizations, around 500 of them from mosques, madrasas, professional organizations, Muslim, women's networks, disabled, you know, so it's a really vast network. And when I was elected to this role, Alhamdulillah, I just thought, wow, you know, Allah has opened a door for good uh, for me. So I have to take it and I have to seize that opportunity and do the best that I can. And so what does that mean for me? And being the first woman, I always think, well, I'm not going to be the last. <laughs> so absolutely, I've got to bring more women with me. I've got to bring young people to the conversation and to the table because what I always think is as a young leader, you know, I'm making decisions that are going to impact the future. So I'm going to make them with the future in mind. And so, you know, let's get more young people involved. Let's get more women involved. And let's think about our diversity. You know, we're such a diverse community. So we've got to bring that to the forefront. So, you know, in my role and, and my message, I guess, to everybody is think about the opportunity to do good in big ways and in small ways. Because that's what Ramadan tells us, like every minute of your day 
you have an opportunity to, to, to do good. That's simply by being nice to a person, by feeding, you know, your loved ones, a bit about cleaning, a bit of cooking, a bit of Quran. I mean, just imagine that Allah has given us a full day of blessing. And I always think, oh my gosh, did I make the most of it, you know? Um, and it is obviously, you know, we are still in unusual circumstances with the pandemic and, you know, many people are going through really challenging times right now, bereavement, loss, the economic impact, the mental health, um, you know, issues. And, and so just think about that, the good that you could do in this difficult time, you know, what a blessing it is to be in this Ramadan compared to so many who won't, who won't be able to enjoy it with their loved ones who may not be here with us but also who may still be isolated at this time, maybe shielding, maybe in hospital. So I think there is so much scope here for us to do a little bit of kindness that I, inshallah we should definitely to, to seize that opportunity. And then the next thing I always think about, um, you know, in, in this blessed month of Ramadan and, and my first uh, Ramadan as Secretary General is I always think about the, con the concept of humility, you know, and I always say to Allah, um, my mom's probably really good at this. As, as high as I may go in, in terms of position and authority, please keep my heart humble and remind me that you are the ultimate creator. You are the ultimate power, you know. So it's not me. I'm just one person who's been blessed with a position and with, with some power as such. But really, it's, it's all down to you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's, it's up to you how good I'm going to do. Just help me along. And so I think realizing that when we put our head our forehead to that prayer mat that little moment is is that the, the most humble we can ever be in our existence you know that act of worship and I think you have to embody that in your your whole day and as a leader you absolutely have to embody that because you're always you know it's easy to forget you know in the in the rigmarole of the day and and in my day I will do interviews I'll do parliamentary meetings I'll do high stakeholder meetings I'll do I'll do so many different things in which I have a vast amount of responsibility and I have to check myself I have to think okay am I really you know have I been the best that I could be is my character the best that it could be and I think that's where Ramadan is amazing because it gives us that wake up call to really reflect on our behaviors and our actions and to think about, um, you know, in, in all honesty, where we're really at and where we need to go, where we need to be at, you know, who we are and who we wish to become. And I think these are really important in terms of, you know, maybe just to give a very small example, you know, I have many friends and they say, you know, so I get really frustrated at work. Some of my colleagues just wind me up and I'm sorry, but it's really hard to restrain. And I'm thinking, oh, well, <laughs> I don't know if I, if I can speak here, you know. And it's those little moments where, you know, and then, you know, and one of my friends said, you know, what I realized is actually that person had some other things going on that day. Hence, their behavior was a little bit out of the, the norm. So my point being is that sometimes we're all going through things. And sometimes our experiences with, with, with one another can be unpleasant because each of us are coming from different places. And we're, we're in the moment, we're in the emotion and we're, we're, we're flustered, right? We're not really thinking about why is this person communicating the way they're communicating? Is there something else that's at play here? Um, as opposed to just, I'm gonna respond and I'm gonna tell you exactly what I think. You know, so so I think it's these little moments in our every day. They're small moments, but they actually could ruin someone's day. They could ruin your own day. And in some ways, they could take away from your goodness and your good deeds. So I think it's so integral for all of us to really think about, you know, how are we coming across in our communication? And are we humble? You know, are we, are, do we need a little humility? And a top tip for me and something that a, a wonderful scholar advised to me was, this is a time where you want to do good, uh, you know, where the what the right hand gives and the left hand doesn't see, right? So we need to be in the habit of giving good deeds that nobody can see, you know, personal good deeds, the private good deeds, sorry. So these are the deeds that nobody can see and, and be in the habit of apologizing and making amends, especially if you know you've upset someone and use Ramadan for that occasion. And I, I tell you what, an apology goes a long way most of the time. That's what people are really looking for. And my final message, I'm not sure how long I've got, um, but I'll maybe just end with this one and then we can we could do some Q&A if you like. 
is really just thinking about the the impact that you want to make after the month okay so absolutely all of us in this ramadan mode are going to be thinking oh my god you know nearly 10 days gonna seize like little gather odd nights gotta give gotta pray and we know the routine right we know the drill we're gonna go all in but then ramadan ends <laughs> and who have we become what will we do what will change and what is the impact that we will leave what is the impact that we will make and i think that's the question we've got to ask ourselves every day before this month ends because until we are ready to face the world post ramadan we'll end up just coming out with the usual habits doing the usual things and nothing will have really changed and that's why allah blesses us with this month once a year <laughs> just to to get back on track but you know and 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 to conclude you know with myself you know i think about you know being the secretary general of the muslim council of britain i think about that opportunity of good and i think about the impact and people say to me zara so you know you're going to do your two years what's the impact going to be what are you going to be happy with when you finish and i say if i could just leave this work if i could develop some leaders that will continue doing the work that i'm doing if i could do a little bit of good for a lot of people you know inshallah if i could just make sure that i develop the next generation of people that were inspired that felt confident that that they that we as muslims could share in the beauty of our religion i mean i would be very happy with that whatever good that allah could accept so thank you so much inshallah that's everything for me and i look forward to a little bit of conversations and i pray allah accepts our fast and grants us goodness and success i mean i mean thank you so much sarah that was it's really, really wonderful. So many interesting points. Um, and I absolutely agree. We do need balance and harmony and seeking the opportunity to, to do good and um, continue that throughout the year after Ramadan as well. And you're absolutely right. Ramadan is an absolutely fantastic opportunity to create that in us and or reinvigorate um, that in us because it has been, the last year has been challenging for everyone globally. And and lots of people have had challenges in their personal lives and their family lives and their work lives and the impact of COVID-19 um, sadly has been widespread. But, you know, if we can still hold on to those qualities and, you know, do good, spread a smile. Um, my father always says a smile is free. Um, yeah, my dad says that too. Kindness is free, Zara. <laughs> it doesn't cost anything. <laughs> exactly. My dad definitely says, think along the same lines. And it's true. Um yeah, kindness, a, a smile go a really, really long way. And um, you've touched on so many interesting points. And um, I'd just like to, first of all, before, um, I, I mean, I've got several questions for you, but it'll be really, really great to hear from everyone who's joining us. If you have any questions and you're tuning in from um, YouTube or Facebook, just jump on the Zoom. And for those who are on the Zoom, we would love to hear your comments and any questions as well for Zara. So um, the Muslim Council of Britain has... Um, Azreen has 500 affiliates. Um, what challenges have you faced in the role? So I think there, there's definitely there's been several challenges. I think my first week of election was something I couldn't have quite imagined. I got global attention. And, you know, I was doing like nine interviews a day. There was like media hysteria. Everybody wanted a piece. And I think it just got to a point where, you know, although much like, most of it was very positive, some of it was very kind of critical and like, are they even going to let you lead? Can you lead? Can a Muslim woman lead? You know, so there was all this kind of like, oh, well, really, you know, are they really going to put her in charge? And that kind of was demoralizing. And I think it kind of made me wake up to the fact how Muslim women are still, you know, really stereotyped. There's so many of these prejudices and tropes around us but anyway you know after that it only made me stronger because I realized that you know I'd be happy to smash some of these um, stereotypes and to continue to do the good work I think you know being a, a woman leader and being a young person I would probably say being a young person is is maybe the bigger challenge because a lot of people don't I mean I don't want to say they don't take you seriously but I think they don't know what to expect you know because like I'm 29 and I'm running this really big organization and, you know, I'm high energy. So, <laughs> so yeah, I think, you know, but I think the biggest challenge in all honesty is the, the one inside, you know, I, I always say to people, I used to suffer from imposter syndrome and I think we all do to some extent. 
And it's that little niggling self-doubt, you know. And I think in this role, you have to be confident about your decisions. You, you know, you want you don't want to regret anything and you want to do things in the best way you can. But hey, we're 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 human, we're gonna make mistakes. So I think the biggest challenge is always the one inside of you. But alhamdulillah, it's, it's been a, a really inspiring journey. It's been a big adventure. It's been a lot of learning on the job. But I, I must say, you know, it's a blessing. And I just hope that, you know, I, in the, my first couple of weeks, I co-opted eight women onto my national council. So, you know, things like that <laughs> just make me really excited to continue the work. Oh, wow. Well, that actually leads on really nicely to my next question. Um, because um, I was reading also that you advise um, companies on training and development, and you have spoken about imposter syndrome. Um, how can you encourage um, women to overcome those obstacles and rise to positions of leadership? Yeah, it's a really important question. And, and you know, I think I faced the same thing with my own leadership journey as well, because you know, you're constantly, I don't know, the voice inside of my head was that, you know, is there someone better? Are you really the right person for the role? Maybe there's someone else. There's a lot of judgment. There's a lot of self-doubt and a lot of self-criticism. And I think what I found is that there's a couple of things that are really important that you've got to do, right? Obviously, the first one people say is believe in yourself, but that's so hard. (laughs) So the second one I would say is surround yourself by people that are really vested in you. You know, surround yourself by good friends, good companions. The Prophet, peace be upon him, he said, you know, you are on the religion of the five people that you spend the most time with. So look at your WhatsApp chat and think of the five people that you WhatsApp the most, you know, uh, the people that you are constantly influenced by. And if they're not a positive force of good, if they're not encouraging you, and if they're not pushing you, you might want to get a few new ones into that list. And because what you need is people that drive you forward. I couldn't have taken the steps that I took without that encouragement, like Zara, you, you got this, you can do it, you know, why not? As well as that honest reality check, you know, the people that will give you a bit of humble pie and just let you know, like, uh, no, that was not good. So you need to be surrounded by good people, you know, whoever your support network is, really tap into that. And then the third thing I would say is you need to push out of that comfort zone one inch at a time okay so don't I mean people a lot of people say to me Zara oh you do a lot of public speaking how do you do it and I said I put myself in some really scary public speaking situations you know at university I was a first year student and I did an announcement to 500 of my fellow classmates and it was not planned I was completely like oh my god what is happening but it gave me a real taste of public speaking and you know they all clapped And so what I would say is you may not want to go for that approach, but what I would say is like, you've got to push yourself every day a little bit out of your comfort zone. You know, whether it's applying for a job you wouldn't apply for, whether it's making, you know, reaching out to that person on LinkedIn, just send them something or writing or blogging or drawing or whatever it is, you know, go out there and, and, and seize it. Because if you sit, nothing is going to change. The world will change, but you will still be the same. And so you really need to kind of brace yourself. And I think for women, you know, it's important for you to actually like who you are. That, that's really important. You know, if you don't like who you are, if you don't believe in yourself, it will be hard for others to do so. But I think all of these things take time. You're not going to do it overnight. And, you know, inshallah, just keep making dua to Allah to, to give you a helping hand. That's very true. And um, it is important to seize the day, to be confident in yourself. And yeah, you've got to have the right people behind you. It makes such a big difference. And um, Iman, I'm just going to hand over to Iman, who has an absolute, oh, Sarah agrees. So probably we move on to Iman. Yeah, Sarah says, you know, I agree about pushing yourself beyond your comfort zone. It's not always easy, though. And faith really helps. Absolutely, Sarah. And um, Iman, over to you, because I understand you have a question um, for Zara as well. Yeah, uh, Assalamu alaikum. Um, I really enjoyed listening to you speak. It was, it's really inspiring seeing, you know, some some representation as women in these leadership positions. So I'm uh, just curious, because you mentioned that, you know, you want to match all these stereotypes, but sometimes I feel um, within our own communities, we have stereotypes in place for like women. So wondering did you deal with any of those kinds of stereotypes or you know did you successfully smash them all or you know 
Yeah, I was yeah, just, I'm well, just curious, like, no, no, what I, kinds did you even, like, face? Absolutely. No, I mean, I think even before I decided to run, I did think, is this something <laughs> that's possible, you know? And I was on the leadership team before, and I was kind of one of these kind of hard working in the background I was involved in lots of different things and I guess I kind of showed everybody what I could do especially in this last year with the pandemic I you know was involved in the internal the external and represent so I was doing so many things and when the election came and I was having those conversations you know what was so inspiring for me was that you know the feedback I got from our members mainly men is that, you know, Zara, we see what you've done, you see your hard work, we like your vision, we like what you've done, and we feel like you're in the, you're going the right direction. And the thing people forget is that, you know, like, mashallah, like now I'm third generation, you know, a lot of, um, I guess, if we're talking about men in specific, but a lot of, there's a lot of daughters, granddaughters, nieces, sisters, you know, that I am, I seem to represent for a lot of people in our communities, you know, and they want their, their young females to have role models. They want them to be involved in community work, you know? So I found that there was definitely an opportunity that I could support, you know, this generation of women that needed that support. But I think the stereotypes are always gonna be there. They're from, they're all kinds, they're, their gender, their ethnicity, their background, their sectarian, you know, we've got, and every community has these. But I think for us, what's really important is how do we how do we find ways to bring people together? And I know people say that's a bit cliche, but it's I don't want to impose myself on anyone. I want to find a way that I can work with people, you know, and it may start with a comfortable place to slow. So what I say is, you know, look, I'm, I'm not a woman leader. I'm just a leader. I represent a broad diversity of people. But because I'm a woman, I can then do a little bit more. Right. So. So I don't kind of push that whole, well, it's got to be my way or the highway. I work with people and try and find that commonality. So I think what I would say is don't be, don't be put down. Don't feel, you know, don't feel disheartened by the challenge, because if we don't take those steps, who is going to, you know, and if we're not willing to take some of that criticism, then what's really going to change? And, you know, inshallah, with all change, it's going to take time. I don't think everybody's my fan, but, you know, if they want to be, I'll welcome that too. I'll do my best. <laughs> well, yeah, that's great because, you know, sometimes you don't expect your own communities to be the people that are the biggest hurdle for you getting to a specific, you know, point or like trying to achieve something. So, yeah, it's just, I, I thought it was really interesting ha hearing it from, you know, someone that's actually there on the front line like you you know in a leadership position and yeah i think you're doing great stuff so inshallah mm -hmm. like you achieve everything that you set out to do inshallah thank you so much thank you so much Iman. and uh, zara you probably heard this other dad quote as well that you know not everyone is going to like you and and not everyone is going to like the same things as you as long as you're happy with who you are you often have conversations here in my house you with between siblings and we've always been brought up oh I don't like this or you don't like this or whatever just with each other when you're joking my dad's like as long as you're happy as long as you're happy that's the most important thing and I think that's so so important as well and um that actually Iman's question and your response brings us really nicely to the next question as well because um obviously the Muslim Council of Britain um they do unite um a great number of um people who hold a diverse interpretation of Islam so how can, based on the work that you do in bringing different um, interpretations of people with different interpretations of Islam together, what can be done on a community level to improve community cohesion so that, you know, people see each other as Muslims without attaching, you know, a prefix or a suffix to it? Yeah, no, it's a really important point and it is part of our work, which is, you know, how do we bring, and that's why it's great to be a diverse umbrella and non-sectarian, non-partisan, you know, we bring together a lot of people. And the reason we do it is because at the heart of it all is, you know, we as British Muslims or Muslims in Britain, you know, we're seeking to have uh, fairness, justice, equality, you know, all these kinds of things. And I think 
we can come together on the things that we do agree on. So we don't need to be unified in everything that we do, but we can unite. Like for example, Islamophobia affects all of us, you know, even affects some people that aren't Muslims, you know, because they look like they're Muslims. So, so the, these are big issues. So the way we do it is we unite on the, the points that are common. And the other thing is like visit my mosque project. That's one of our flagship projects where we invite local communities to visit the mosque everybody takes part and it's a wonderful kind of occasion in which we showcase the best of our communities. I think throughout this pandemic as well, we've seen the role that Muslims have played, you know, from the front line, key workers, you know, uh, the most actually heavily impacted disproportionately in, in death. And I think cohesion really begins first with the mindset that we're willing, you know, I think there's got to be a willingness at the start, but then I think it's about the goal so if we want to see a better society in which young people get all the opportunities they deserve and they don't face those barriers because of their name, because they wear a hijab, then absolutely haven't we got to do something together? You know, we, we know about institutional racism, the impact that's had. And then we think about other things simply, which is Islam is so beautiful, isn't it meant to be shared in a positive way? So we do have a responsibility as Muslims to, to share our religion in the best way. And, and I think it, it's a, always a tricky balance with these things because, you know, some people are like, well, cohesion will only work if you do it my way. <laughs> so you're always going to get that. But I think there are definitely more things now that we have to work on together for the future of British Muslims, you know, for our, our common future. What about the environment and sustainability? You know, that's a, that's a huge issue right now. You know, climate change. What about the refugee crisis? You know, there are things even beyond the theological that we have to play a role in. And I think these are the things, these are the conversations we need to have, you know, for us to change things. Zara, I, I literally think you are reading my mind today because the next question in my list is, um, so also we've got some questions from Rehan is, um, how as Muslims can we be more sustainable in our um, daily life? Oh, lovely. That's so important. And that's, you know, a topic that's very important for me. Um, but yeah, over to you. Well, absolutely. I'm really passionate about this area as well. I think that, you know, more environmentalism is needed. Absolutely. I mean, it was great. I believe it was two years ago when Moss started to, to ban single use plastics and, and, you know, starting to have kind of that, you know, those water bottles. And so that there's, I mean, I think the starting place of all of this is first recognizing we all have a responsibility that Islam even teaches us we've got to take care of the earth you know, we, we are caretakers in that regard and we've got to be part of that bigger picture. I think, you know, in Ramadan, waste, unfortunately, still is, um, it's big. We do waste a lot in this month, although we don't get to eat too much because there isn't that much time. But, you know, portion control could sometimes get ahead of us. I would say that Muslims generally, I think, have been on, a, you know, are on a good, are on the right track with this because more of us are coming out, you know, with eco iftar, sustainability, you know, banning single use plastics. But I think generally, whatever small good you can do, whether it's the recycling or, you know, food waste, you know, plants and growing your own vegetables or recycling your clothes. I mean, the list is endless, but I think, We've all got a role to play in this conversation and imagine us being, you know, the standard bearers for what is excellent. You know, that I think would be so powerful for us to show leadership in. So I think absolutely. I mean, this is an area where you probably have loads of good advice in terms of what can be done. But I think ultimately we have to take responsibility. We have to take some ownership of this and we can't just be like, oh, well, you know, it's too big an issue. Well, what's it got to do with me? Um, absolutely it's got everything to do with you okay um but I'm gonna look at my, I'm gonna check myself first before I get too high and mighty here <laughs> because uh, I'm sure I could do better so I don't want anyone doing an expose on the secretary generals <laughs> I do recycle though just to let everybody know <laughs> you might have somebody going through your your recycling bin, right yeah yeah I know I better, I better watch out <laughs> so no yeah it's really important inshallah we should do more and I absolutely agree with you. It's about doing more and also recognising that, you know, there's so much more we can do, but to recognise that what we are doing, it's still a step forward in the right direction um, because, you know, we've been blessed with one planet and it's so important to care for our planet as well. And um, I'm going to pop on um, Reha now, who's um, 
who's also got a great comment as well. He said, we put great emphasis on recycling um, in Ramadan tent and in the in-person iftars. Absolutely. We recycle everything. Um, Rehan, over to you. You have a question for Zara and Sam. Yeah. Sorry, um, so what has, you've already met quite a few, but what was the, what's been the biggest challenge for the MCB during the pandemic? Uh, probably a kind of a generic question, but probably an important one. No, it, it's good. There's, there's a lot to cover on that one. I guess I can kind of talk about, I mean, maybe a couple of areas. So obviously, because at the start of the pandemic, it literally was a crisis, you know, so we had to work, I guess, 24 seven to get, because there's a lot of panic and there was a big need for community reassurance. And we're an umbrella organization. So what was really great was we provided a national platform for not just our members, but beyond, you know, our non-members too. To, so we had a working group on bereavement and burial. You know, there was a whole scare around cremation. So we did a webinar where like a thousand, over a thousand people joined, you know, what is happening? Are we gonna get cremated? You know, there was a whole need for governance in mosques, health and safety, risk assessments. There was a lot on the charity sector, which was hit really hard, bringing together our charitable partners. Hajj and Umrah was affected, you know. So I think we had to, mental health was another year. So we kind of formed these, um, COVID response groups and they covered the different areas and I think the challenge was keeping a pace with the rate of change and then the other part of it which was the well-being piece I think a lot of people forget about this because although we were working so hard and our staff was working so hard we kind of forgot we had to take care of ourselves and that you know some of our own staff or you got COVID or family members was bereavement and I think sometimes in the the bid to try and save every save the world you forget to take care of yourself and remember the little things you know and I think what COVID has taught us and what crisis teaches us is that much other there's so much generosity communities come together you know faith was like a fourth frontline service you know we needed you know mosques went digital they continued to provide you know there was that chaplaincy and support so I think the community really stepped up we had to step up in a big way too. But I think the key, key thing is that, you know, sometimes you run really fast and you need to slow down because otherwise you're going to burn out. And I think, you know, after the, you know, because they, we had then Ramadan at home and then Eid at home and there was just a lot going on. I think in this kind of now, the, the start of this year, maybe things we were able to just kind of gather our thoughts again and think about, okay, well, can we do this a bit differently and where are we at and what do we need? So I think, the pandemic certainly challenged us and you know everybody was remote you know so everyone had to get used to that as well and I mean personally I quite enjoyed that because that worked out great for me <laughs> less traveling less time on the train but I think for a lot of people it's that isolation and loneliness especially you know when we were having some of like Ramadan what some of the most social occasions of the year and we can't go visit you know our family members so I think there's different levels of challenge but probably the toughest was the personal in a bid to deliver so yeah I mean it's taught us a lot and I think moving forward there's so much to do especially with recovery as well. Thank you so much and um, mental health again really really important um, topic that you've um, touched on we have about five minutes left until um, Margaret Banan in London um, I don't know what time is it around the same time for you? No, it's kind of like 9.03 or something. So oh, wow. yeah, I'm just going to be more time for prayer and reflection and, you know, all those lovely things. So oh, fantastic. We'll, we'll, we'll make use of those five minutes because we've got final thanks as well. But we can always do that after the morning, just getting uh, maybe another question as well. So you spoke and said about mental health and accessibility. How can we make the post pandemic, how can we make the Islamic faith? more accessible mm. and in terms of equity of access as well because like you said services have been restricted um for yeah for muslims across the country so how what can we do to um make things more equi um, equitable and easier to access post pandemic especially as we know like to talk about women and prayer spaces so to be quite pleased to hear your thoughts on that yeah no absolutely i think obviously you know the pandemic has made you know the situation quite different you know going into mosques uh, you know the the layout to the, the the PPE required you know so there's there's a complete change as to what that experience looks like and I, but I think one thing that we've one thing I've been really happy about is accessibility particularly with the online because it's even like with 
you're far away or disabled or there's lots of people in remote places in the UK that don't have big Muslim communities so I think equity of access is really important for those individuals too which is just being able to listen to the Friday sermon if you cannot get to that the mosque or listen to five of them you know at your leisure and um, you know for madrasa classes I know for a lot of kids doing it online was brilliant as opposed to going in um, and, and some of the elderly community as well you know so I think but definitely with women with disability with all these different key stakeholders for most communities absolutely we always make it you know part of our guidance a part of our webinars to say look we need to make sure that that access is available we're absolutely the 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 conditions allow for it, the space allows for it. And, you know, with all of the different, you know, uh, regulations in place, but we should always strive for that equity of access, absolutely, and do our best because it is a challenging time and definitely things are difficult and different mustards have different kinds of access and accommodation. And, you know, credit to mosques at the time as well. They've had to deal with an unbelievable amount of um, pressure, especially with the bereavement and loss, nikahs marriages ceremonies and you know all the usual services and you know also most people won't appreciate that at this time most don't get their normal juma collections so some of them have really struggled in paying the bills and um, but certainly you know we'll continue to push um for equity of access for all and supporting mosques you know we're needed to get that in place and like i always like to think that you know it's got to be partnership and we've got to work together um, but certainly, you know, with the women at the helm, <laughs> I think it's going to be, uh, it's a no brainer from my side. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, I've had a fantastic comment from um, Sarah here. Sarah, because listen to you all night, you make such interesting comments about wide, a wide range of topics. Um, Zara, it's just absolute pleasure. Um, I'm conscious of the time. I have a couple of minutes before we move to our barn. Um, do you have any final remarks? I've, I've really enjoyed today's um, conversation. You've been an absolute pleasure to host, thinking along the same line. So really loving it. Oh, no, thank you so much. I mean, I guess, uh, first of all, Duno, just thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you all today and go on. I'm glad, humble it has been a benefit. I guess my final message is that, you know, that this uh, Ramadan Tent Project is just such a wonderful initiative. And I think you bring a lot of different people together. You give that space for contemplation and reflection and you give that opportunity for good and I'm really grateful to be part of that especially with the global iftar so good luck with that what I would say is that for anybody who's maybe going through a bit of difficulty a bit of challenge a little bit of introspection a lot of people at this time are thinking about a change in pace of life and a change in direction I know a lot of people that are doing a change of career or they you know they want to be self-employed they want to work differently I feel like we're at this the pandemic has created this opportunity for us to to choose a different way. And what I would say to people is to find that little bit of courage inside, to be brave and to go for it. Because, you know, what we've seen is that actually, just like that, Allah can say, no, we're gonna do everything completely different. You're gonna have to unlearn your ways and you're gonna have to find that, you know what? You're not gonna be able to go out. You're not gonna be able to do work like you are. You're not going on holiday this year, you know? The moral of the story being is that if we truly have faith, then anything is possible. And so put your faith in Allah and aim high and go and make that change. You know, I'm sure you'll do even better than me. I'll do my bet. You better do yours. And we'll just make dua that Allah will grant us success, keep us humble, give us the opportunity to be amongst those he loves the most. And of course, to be of service to all of humanity, inshallah. So thank you so much from everybody at the MCB. Have a blessed Ramadan and hopefully a good Eid, inshallah, when it comes. Thank you so much, Sarah. We're going to go to Azan now, then we'll do a final thanks. So if you could hold on for us to do another big thank you to you, that would be fantastic. And um, we should go over to Azan now. Allahumma inni laka sumt wa bika amant وعلى رزقك أفطرت ذهب الظمأ وبتلت العروق وثبت الأجر إن شاء الله الله أكبر
اکبر اللہ اکبر اللہ اکبر اشہد اللہ اشہد اللہ الہ الا اللہ اشہد ان محمد الرسول اشہد ان محمد الرسول اللہ حی علی الصلاة I'd like to say a big thank you once again to today's speaker, Zara Mohammed, um, the first female Muslim Secretary General for the Muslim Council of Britain. Zara, it's been a pleasure, so engaging, so inspiring. Thank you for discussing such a wide range of topics with us in such a short period of time. Um, and I just want to say before we end uh, for now, a big thank you to Islam Channel, who is our media partner this year, and also to the Arts Council UK for making this event possible. You can read more about how we're fighting world hunger with Islamic relief at iruk.co forward slash rtp. Ramadan is a month of giving, and we want to encourage you to support Ramadan 10 and help us to continue our work. Your support is vital to keeping us going as the world transitions back to normality. And by helping us continue with events like this one, bringing people together from around the world, and um, as well as our open iftars, our sunnah fasts, and other projects, you can check out the link in the chat box. Any amount you give will be appreciated, and it's very beneficial, inshallah. You can donate online to launchgood.com forward forward slash RTP 2021. And um, we're continuing our global iftar this uh, tonight and uh, throughout the night. Um, click on the link. Join us, get involved, and um, 
we're going to keep going. So as, as many of you as can join us, we would absolutely love it. So thank you so much. And for now, Salam Aleikum for me. Thank you once again, Zara. And thank you everybody today for joining us. And we'll see you all shortly.